Hey guys, welcome to our weekly Bacon Cast series. Uh, today we're going to be discussing everything E3, uh, our post E3 highlights, on Battlefield One drama related to uh, female avatars, and a Kickstarter called Mighty Number no. Nine, which has been getting mixed reviews lately, and we'll discuss why. We have a special guest this week. Kitten is joining us. Yo. Yo yo. And uh, as always, I'm Francis. Joining me is Nick and Thomas. Hey, guys. We want to talk about uh, some the rest of the Play to Win team. Hey, guys. So we are streaming Planet Side 1. Not Planet Side 2, Planet Side 1. The reason we are doing this is because they are DBG. Is it DBG? Mm-hmm. Yes, Daybreak Games, formerly SOE, Sony Online Entertainment. Right, DBG is shutting down the Planet Side One server, which is running under someone's desk, apparently. So they apparently can't foot the bill for that. I, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I, I don't know why. Uh, their ex- reasoning is that they can't just port it over onto like a new rig because of issues. So they pretty much have been having to maintain a really old computer. And it's getting to the point where it's hard to find parts for it at this point. So, mm-hmm. yeah, um, that's that's the reason they're bringing it down. What special parts would it be would be required? You need a CPU. And that's it, right? CPU. Uh, things got to be compatible. And if unknown errors when I don't know, I, I don't know, that's. Given to us, you but... can you can boil down the understanding of what's happened to PS1 and its death rattles by comparing it to a daytime soap opera. It's like, okay, let's look at um, something stupid like Grey's Anatomy. They wrote out Catherine Heigl, but they never killed her off. And so people are sat there going, bring her back, bring her back. And essentially, that's what Planet Side 2 is. It's the redheaded stepchild that nobody wanted. You know, it wasn't what we were promised. And we're sat here saying, look at Planet Side 1, bring Planet Side 1 back. So I think they're taking it out to the pasture and shooting it so that we stop bringing it up. That'll never happen. <laughs> so harsh. But you, you gave it a reference that I had no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> Watch Grey's Anatomy. You can do it with NCIS as well. Anyways, but it, it came out in 2003. came out in May 2003. Um, so Yeah, it's an old game. It, it's an old game. It's not a lot of people play it. Um, there are lots of hackers, usually. Uh, but it is it, it's one of those things that since it is going away July first, we're uh checking it out uh just to bring back the memories because this is a game I played a lot. It was really my first foray into any sort of group based MMO online play. So Yeah. It's gotta be one of my first two, especially back in two thousand three. That was uh pre World of Warcraft. Um there were not that many uh, MMO FPSs. I don't think there were any actually. No, there I was think like one was was like a proprietor of MMO FPS. Right. I remember back then you'd Google MMO FPS and there'd be basically nothing. Um, so there'd be um, like EverQuest and those games, and then you'd have this, which is that's it for an MMO FPS. I mean, um. So, so what are we going to see in the game th- today? What are you going to show us? It's been so long since I've played this. I don't remember anything. So we'll show check the out the heart. map. Yeah, real quick. I need to check out the map so you All right. where some people are. Where are we? If there are people. So you spawn in. You spawn at your sanctuary. Um, from here, you can either pull a vehicle, go through the warp gates, go to the continent, or you can go into this building right here and get on the heart. What does heart stand for? High altitude rapid transport. Reconnaissance transport, transport, wasn't it? Or rapid transport? I think it was rapid. I think rapid sounds more like it because that thing is not stealthy at all. You'd, uh, like, I'd assume something reconnaissance would be, yeah. Oh, I was just about to say, uh, look at the inventory, but then the heart arrived. <laughs> okay, so one major difference between this and Planet Side 2 is um, in Planet Side 2, they got rid of the inventory system. 
where in this game you actually had to do inventory management. You had to pick up guns and pick up ammo. You could swap it out. You can kill people, pick up their ammo to refill your ammo. Uh, the different factions had proprietary ammo as well for different guns. Some of their guns. Seems a little too complicated. It was... It isn't a first-person shooter in the modern sense. Or I guess mm-hmm. any, like, the original sense. It was definitely an RPG, a first-person shooter hybrid, or an action RPG. Or action first-person shooter, however you want to classify it. It was it was more of a uh, strategy RPG first person shooter because there was a lot of planning that went into operations. There was a lot of waiting around, inventory management and things like that. I mean, it was all a lot of planning. It was like, oh, okay, so we're going to go in against Genhold. We want more ammo for our softies, which is what the uh, infantry was called, than we do for our maxes, which was, you know, maxes as they are in Planet Side 2 right now. Um, so the Maxes, nine times out of ten, would take enough armor for them to break a hammerhead in the siege. But then after that, would just be filled with ammo for all of the uh, squishies in the room. So was this? Did this used to be like a really popular game? Because I never really played. Oh yeah. One. First three or four years, it was extremely popular, all things considered. But you, I mean, you would have multiple continents that were pop locked, which in this game I think was like three hundred and sixty people per continent. And you got to remember, back in 2003, 2004, that's a lot of people. That was per continent, per empire, and and way back then there was multiple servers as well. Oh, really? Yeah. So an example of the inventory system right now. So I'm going to come up to this door, and I want to go in, right? Well, i got to hack this stupid door. Well, I have my engineer tool, my medic tool on my heart bar, so I actually need to open my inventory, get my rack, switch them out, Oops. And then I can hack it, and then either I can switch it back or do whatever I need to do. Seems like an interesting game. It just it's definitely not as popular as it used to be. No. So where are we at? I'm gonna bio lab. Let's uh, check some ve- check out some vehicles. Did you guys discuss the uh, the skill point system? Um, no. Where you can't, unlike Planet Side Two, you can't play every class. You can't just dynamically switch classes whenever you the, wanted to. The thing is, is that there's so much about Planet Side One that actually would need describing. I mean, if you go into the inventory point system, then you know, obviously, you would need to sort of like go into the different ways of capturing a base and so. It, Planet Side 1 is so different to Planet Side 2 in the mm-hmm. sense of the strategy and, and the overall um, presentation that it gave as a gamer, which was probably why it was largely so popular, is because it was something for everybody. You know, you could specialize in being a hacker, like Snipe is hacking right now, and he has a purple hacking beam. I would have a blue hacking beam, which would make me faster than him. Um, he is in an LLU base, which is a uh, lattice logic unit, I believe, where he it's literally capture the flag, for lack of a better term. He has to pick it up and run with it to um, the base that's designated. Um, he'll probably get killed on the way because the LLU tells everybody on the continent that it's been spawned. So enemies, friendlies, all make a beeline for it. Hey, did you just kill someone? Wait, was that, yeah, was that yep. a real person or a turret? Yeah, no, that was a real person. Yeah, there's a person who was, was AFK. AFK. <laughs> Nice. Okay. So the LLU is something kind of like capture the flag where mm-hmm. you have to take this ball back to your base in order to capture the enemy base. That's a long run. Yeah, it's kind of like a mini game that it is, things up a little bit. But there's also a timer involved in it as well, so it's not a case of, oh, you know, I can just run with it until it's done. It's either within 15 minutes or until the enemy hacks the base back. And also, you can't be in the pilot seat of any vehicle. You can only ride in passenger seats of ground vehicles. And any vehicle you're in, its speed is reduced by like 30% or something. Mm-hmm. And if at any time the LLU hits water, it's gone. It gets blown up. Mm-hmm. Wow. 
It seems like there's a big learning curve before you can really get into depth in this set in this game. There is. I mean, a lot of modern shooter games, um, they go into the free to play um, model because they know that you're not going to get the same kind of dedication that Planet Side had back in 2003. There's no such thing as loyalty in the modern player base now. The average gamer is thought to be aged around about 35, and for us, it's nostalgia. But new marketing is aimed at much younger generations, and much younger generations have, and I hate to say this, an ADHD mentality. It's like, okay, I played this. This sucks. This is boring. Bye. Two weeks later, and they're in something new. So yeah. subscription-based gaming isn't really profitable anymore because it, it doesn't attract the audience it used to. I mean, isn't that's not necessarily uh, the generation's fault. I mean, that's game developers' faults, too. They design their games to feed that mentality so that mentality just grows. Mm-hmm. Right. I read an article recently about Overwatch, and one of the reasons why Overwatch is so successful is because they have a, a oh, they prepay scared. model of where you just have to pay 60 bucks, well, 60 US dollars, or 80 Canadian dollars, or however many um, pounds or euros. 3,000 <laughs> now because the pound dive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the Brexit happened uh, earlier this week, and we can talk about that, but I'm just salty, so you'll see me throw that out a lot. <laughs> right, just save it up. Um, so Overwatch is a game where you have to pay 60 bucks, but it does have um, microtransactions. It's it mostly for... That's a friendly. Uh, it's mostly for skins and like stuff that doesn't really matter in the game, where you can sort of earn points to get it. And the thing that the blizzard devs have said is that they if they went with a microtransaction model or a um a free to play model it would completely change the dynamic of the game because the way the game works right now is that you can enter a match and you can switch to any character you want to counter what the enemy is doing and that's part of the strategy of the game where when you start getting really like a high end gameplay when you get really good at the game, you know all these characters inside and out, and you know that you know the other team has two Bastions and uh, a Zarya and whatever, right? So you would counter it by, I don't know, maybe going with Widowmaker to take out the Bastions or whatever Tracer, whatever you want, right? Whatever your strategy is. If they were on a free-to-play model, that would have put lots of restrictions on it because you'd have a lot of people that only had like four characters unlocked Yeah, I mean, what Blizzard's done is really smart anyway, because there is that upfront cost, but then what they're really making their money on is the microtransactions behind it, because there are microtransactions in Overwatch. You can buy crates, so you're not buying guaranteed skins. You you could buy 100 crates and end up with 50 duplicates of something. Um, but those microtransactions exist for the mentality that is behind gaming right now, which is this instant gratification, which, you know, governs people buying skins and champions in League of Legends, because you can statistically play that game entirely free to play. But where's the fun in that? There's 132 champions and everybody wants to own them all. And then there's like three skins Mm -hmm. at least for each champion, which is like five bucks at least for each skin. Riot makes a killing off of that, and Blizzard isn't dumb. You know, they've been at this for a long time, so they tapped into the microtransaction, but kept it in line with the um, flow of the game and the fun behind the game. Yeah. Right, and I think that the... I don't don't want to say whether it was a good choice or not, but I think it fits with uh, Blizzard's previous models for their games. Kind of like Diablo 3, where you buy it once and you can play forever. An NC guy just got shragged. Yeah. Did Diablo have uh, microtransactions of any kind? A new one? Um, it, it did have a, like a pay system, right? Where you could buy stuff, buy cash or whatever. A lot of games have microtransactions. So that guy was just looting a body and it's got a free kill. Nice. That's not my shotgun. Uh, so, did Diablo 3 have microtransactions? Because I never actually bought Diablo 3. I never played it. Um, uh, no, not not in that sense. Sort of like the, the appeal to Diablo 3 
other than the expansion, which was Reaper of Souls, um, was buying other Blizzard games. Like, you know, buying the collector's edition of Overwatch would get you wings, which do feck all in Diablo 3, other than make you look kind of cool because they're cosmetic. So I could get Mercy's wings in Diablo 3. In much the same vein, I get a baby Winston pet in World of Warcraft if I buy the collector's edition for um, Overwatch. And they did that with a lot of their games. You know, StarCraft came out and they offered an expansion pack to that. And they offer an expansion pack to World of Warcraft and you'll be able to get stuff for Diablo 3 with it. So they kind of weave everything into their own games, which is one of the things that Sony, now Daybreak, never really did and probably would have profited from much better if they had worked with that same mentality of let's intertwine EverQuest with Planetside and, and, you know, go from there. I don't think people buy games for that reason. Like, I'm not going to buy StarCraft so I can get a little pet in another game or something. You would be surprised, especially females. They will go for it all the time. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking more of... um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> No, no, no it's Come just on. uh Kitten did a long speech and I just lost my train of thought. Anyways, we can come back to it or we can just not come back to it, whatever. Do you guys remember what I was talking about? Was Diablo 3 microtransactions? Right. I remember Diablo 3 had a system where you could sell your gear or sell your drops or whatever, and you can actually make money off of it. They it was the uh shit. The auction house, which they eventually abolished because yeah, so it, it was being exploited. Well, not well. Part of the reason it was being exploited is because their whole loot system when the game first came out was really f- freaking stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, which we talked about actually on one of our original podcasts. Sorry about that. Yeah, we did do a Diablo three uh, podcast. Um, and we talked about it a little bit, but the problem was is loot dropped that was completely worthless. But people didn't know that. So they would sell it on the auction house and people would buy it. And they're buying, you know, even though it's, you know, relatively cheap, only a couple bucks or whatever. But they're buying gear that's completely worthless just because it looks shiny. Like, oh, that's a high level one, you know, and then yeah, well, it's why else would you buy gear? Because it's shiny. It's like in World of Warcraft. You, you want to buy something higher... that's shiny, but that actually benefits Right, right. Yeah, I get that. It's, well, well, that's how it was in World of Warcraft. Like, the higher the tier you got, like, the glowier and the more shiny it was. Actually, no. It was the other way around. In World of Warcraft, it was like the lower level armor would look kind of fabulous around about level 40, 50. But then, especially in vanilla, you'd get to the 60s, and it looked like a piece of crap. <laughs> no, but that was, the, that was the whole thing. Okay, I, I completely understand what you're getting at, because... You can pick up a, a piece of blue gear when you're 40 and 50 and be like, wow, this looks amazing. But when you get to 60, they try to make that blue gear not look as good to entice you to go for the purple gear, which is in like higher end dungeons and raids and that sort of stuff. 